All right, here we go. Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt where we read better, not more. And also thank you for letting me take that mental break that I needed to take uh, from these past few weeks of uploading five videos a week, which was a really big effort on my part. It took a lot of time and I'm really proud of myself for how much I was able to accomplish. So before I dive into what we're going to talk about today, which is that you guys voted for another Sherlock Holmes video for this video today, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping, a little bit of behind the scenes, what's been going on with me and what I want to do for my future scheduling. So I'm going to have the timestamp here so you can just jump to my discussion about Sherlock Holmes if you would like to just jump there. But in the meantime, I did want to share a little bit about what was going on with me. So like I said, I'm very proud of myself for sticking to five videos a week for three weeks in a row. That really boosted my channel. It gave you guys a lot of content and I really enjoyed talking about books that frequently and kind of in that relaxed, just here's what I'm reading, here's what I want to update you guys on kind of matter. Um, manner, in that manner, not matter. But I did find that like, in order to talk that in depth about books on a daily basis, obviously I had to read a lot every day to be able to film every day. And that really got in the way of some of the things that obviously everyone wants to do in their life. Like one night I had a video call with my family and that really put a lot of crunch time on my reading. And it's like, well, I should be able to have those connections and have that time as well. So even though I was on quarantine and even though I'm still on quarantine, and even though I had a lot of time to read, I realized that five videos a week was really not feasible for me for the long term. And I just found it exhausting. So I think moving forward, I am going to do two videos a week. We're gonna do a Wednesday upload, which is gonna be this style of video right here where you guys get to vote on what kind of content I'm gonna do. Um, and then as usual, I will have that poll available on my social media, on my Instagram stories and on my Twitter. So you can participate in what kind of content I make each week. Sorry for my dog barking in the background. He wants to be let in, but I literally just let him out. He's one of, it's the classic hurry up and let me in so I can beg to go out again. So he needs to wait outside for just a little bit longer. Anyway, and then I think I also wanted to share a little bit about my mental health journey because I know that mental health is a topic that we are interested in and talking about and sharing about more and more these days. And I think BookTube in particular is a place where mental health becomes a topic not only in the books that we're reading, but also in the ways that we talk about it in our own lives. So I actually, this past week, had a pretty intense week in terms of my healing journey. And for me, a lot of it is some sadness, some anxiety uh, related to some hurts that have happened to me with just really core and important relationships in my family. And I think, you know, we all have that to a certain extent. Nobody's perfect, no one's parents are perfect, everybody's life, you're gonna have those essential wounds. And I think it's really a wonderful and a helpful step that therapy, counseling, having you know a, a licensed professional in your life to work through some of those things is really, really important. And I, I'm hopeful that this is bringing a new level of health to me, to my family, and to my relationships moving forward. And I think sometimes I forget how exhausting that inner work can be in the same way that like, one of the reasons why I'm so proud of having completed uploading five videos a week for several weeks in a row is that I actually have a really hard time coming through for myself. I have a tendency to really deprioritize my goals, my desires, my wants, and kind of follow whatever shiny object and chasing what other people want or what other people's needs are. And I tend to have a, I have a tendency to sacrifice my own needs and desires for the needs and desires of whoever's the most influential person in my in front of me in that moment even me showing up for myself to do my videos was like a really really big breakthrough for me i don't know if you guys saw but i did a 2020 goals video and then like immediately failed on my goals and that's like so typical for me where i just have a really really hard time showing up for myself and even choosing to 
go to a counselor, spend the money, take the time, to spend time thinking about myself and my own emotions is something that's quite difficult for me to do and for me to justify doing, but I am hopeful that it will be well worth the sacrifice, well worth the trouble for the future. So if any of you are going through difficult times right now, I just wanted to encourage you if you have access to a mental health provider, I'm currently you know, seeing my therapist via video calls, and so that's a really huge blessing. Uh, it continues to be a way for that healthy perspective, that professional perspective to come into my life and to sort of like correct where I can, I can go wrong and just give me encouragement and sort of like a solid ground to stand on. So. If that's available to you, if that's something that you're able to afford or able to have access to, I would really encourage you to do that because I think it's, there's almost no one for whom a certain amount of therapy would not be helpful, even for a short term. So anyway, that's what's been going on with me, just doing some really, really deep inner healing and yeah, trying to pay attention to how tired that makes me. Sometimes that makes me a little bit tired. But here we are, we're gonna talk about Sherlock Holmes. I ended up reading the next story in this collection, which is volume two of the Sherlock Holmes stories. So this is really after, you know, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle has tried to kill off Sherlock Holmes. He's back by popular demand, a little bit begrudgingly it seems, by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who was ready to take on other characters, other works, etc., etc. This story is called The Adventure of the Dancing Men, and it was really, really fun to read because it was a story that is dealing with ciphers and codes, which is one of my favorite things in the world. I absolutely love foreign languages. I love ciphers. I love codes. I always have. The opening scene where we have, of course, our first flourish of Sherlockian his intelligence, he always has like a flourish at the beginning when the new client comes in. And this is really contrasted with how I noticed it went last time. So if you recall from my last video on Sherlock Holmes, it was the first story where the band was back together and I noticed how much character development we had for Watson, where Sherlock made these bold observations and Watson sort of internally was able to track right along with Sherlock, how he was able to perceive these seemingly imperceptible aspects of this character who had walked through the door. The opposite happens this time. Sherlock makes some bold <laughs> observations about Watson himself, and Watson goes, oh, I cannot understand how you could have possibly known that about me. And so we see it reverting back to that old pattern that we had from the original set of stories before the band was back together and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle has brought the team. Now, I think part of it is that it's just a function of form. Like the stories work better when Sherlock Holmes is the one who is able to reveal to the audience, to Watson, to us, to the other inspector that he's working with, whoever may be in front of him, that it comes out of Sherlock's own mouth instead of through Watson's pen. So we kind of have to undo the character development that we saw in the last one. Another thing that I've really noticed with this story in particular is that the crime is really centering around this female character, the wife of a Mr. Cub Cubit or Cubit. I feel like if his name is pronounced Cubit that it shouldn't be. So I'm gonna call him Mr. Cubit. So we have Mrs. Cubit, his wife. So the mystery really revolves around her. She has this mysterious past, they get married quickly. She even admits, I've had some connections to some unsavory people in the past. Don't ask me about my past, etc., etc. But what I find most interesting about this from a sort of functional perspective is that we really never see Mrs. Cubit herself. We see Mr. Cubit, he's the one who brings the case and he's the one who delivers evidence to Sherlock and is the main person that we're dealing with throughout this mystery. And by the time Sherlock has figured it out, he realizes that a violent crime is about to take place. So he rushes over to the scene of the crime. And by the time he gets there, Mr. Cubitt is dead. These are short stories and they're old, but there's going to be spoilers, by the way. So, I mean, a little bit late, but just by the way, <laughs> I'm going to give away the mystery. <laughs> I feel like I should have said that up top. Whoopsies. And Mrs. Cubitt has, you know, a pretty horrible wound and she's gonna, it's like touch and go. Is she gonna be able to survive this tragedy? So we never see Mrs. Cubitt really speak for herself, explain herself, even the criminal who's connected to her and who we eventually capture and are able to prosecute. 
that's my dog. Even uh, he is the one who is sort of revealing Mrs. Cuppet's involvement, what their relationship was like, how they were connected, and revealing the way that he interacted for, with Mrs. Cuppet from his perspective. So I just find it really, really interesting that even though she's the main touch point, she's the main focus of this criminal activity, she's not the main victim, but one of two victims in this situation. But we never ever hear from her perspective. We never even really see her as a character and we really don't know what's going on. Like she's not at all the focus. She is in fact a French character who we only see physically once in the story. I really enjoyed the description of the American crook. So I find that Sherlock Holmes stories have reveal, a, mm, I don't know if they reveal a lot about race, uh, and I mean, they do, all books do, about race and gender, but it's something that I like to pay attention to. So uh, when you see that someone is designated as Irish or Scottish or French or American in this case, I think it's really worth paying attention to and sort of like pr pricking up your ears and making sure you're really listening to what he's saying because these marginal sort of descriptions say a lot about how the culture at the time viewed these things. So we find that this American crook, this evil person who has now come into the story is, uh, what, let's see, his main, name is Mr. Slanley, Slaney, no, Mr. Slaney, the American. And so when we find out that Sherlock, who, he contacted someone in America that he knew, and Abe Slaney, and he basically says he's the nastiest crook in Chicago. That's a really bad Chicago accent. But anyway, we get the description of him. A man was striding up the path which led to the door. He was a tall, handsome, swarthy fellow clad in a suit of gray flannel with a Panama hat, a bristling back black beard, and a great aggressive hooked nose, and, a flourishing, and flourishing a cane as he walked. He swaggered up the path as if the place belonged to him, and we heard his loud, confident peal at the bell. So I found that description particularly interesting, the level of, well, the clothing is really interesting, the way that it's described as this sort of like gangster type of clothing, but also the sort of uh, unwarranted overconfidence of the character. As with our last story, we do see Sherlock Holmes sort of retracing the events of the evening and also retracing the trail of correspondence. Once he's sort of figured out the cipher, he has enough writing samples to be able to break it. He also sort of traces out the what must have been the communiques going back and forth. Then once he gets Abe Slaney in front of him, he actually expands the context and really questions him about the greater context of their relationship as well. And that's something that I really enjoy in the way that the Sherlock Holmes tales sort of uh, f choose to contextualize the mystery overall. Another thing that I find really, really interesting with these Sherlock Holmes stories is the pacing. I think we find that they're a little bit slow at the beginning, and a lot of times it's Sherlock Holmes sort of giving quite answers and saying like, oh, I'm onto it, or oh, I haven't figured it out yet, or blah, 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 but not really revealing what the it is. We don't really discover it at the same time that Sherlock does. It's just a big reveal at the end, very much like, you know, Agatha Christie and Poirot. It's like, okay, we have all the scenes, the evidence is put before us, and then there's the final act where Poirot gets to unveil everything that's happened and reveal his genius. Very much the same thing with Sherlock Holmes, where the whole, the, maybe the evidence is presented to you, but a lot of times not. A lot of times Sherlock Holmes is so observant that it passes by what Watson is able to tell us as the narrator. And so Sherlock Holmes will bring us over and say, oh, there's a bullet hole here, or oh, I noticed this over here. And then he starts taking us through the case as he deconstructs, as he deconstructs it. And I think overall, it, you know, the stories really lend themselves to almost a deconstructionist approach to literary analysis. So that is what I have for you today on Sherlock Holmes. This one was a really fun story because of the cipher. Does anybody else try to break the cipher when you get the new samples on each one? I wonder if the readers at the time were trying to do that as well. Oh, there was one more thing that I wanted to say is uh, apparently Sir Arthur Conan Doyle in a, an attempt to 
maintain a really strong sense of realism, actually used real train schedules when he is talking about Sherlock Holmes traveling to various places. Now using the train came up in our last story, but it came up in this story as well. And that train really affects the outcome of the story and it adds a lot of tension to what Sherlock can and can't do in that moment. So anyway, now I'm done. <laughs> Until next time, my name is Alexandra and I'm still a bibliophile.